I think one very important question is being overlooked, and that is, what is Cyberpunk 2077? It's actually a very complicated question because it's not your run-of-the-mill open-world action-adventure game. It's a fascinating franchise with already tons of established lore coming from the brilliant mind of Mike Pondsmith. A lot of the more casual players, or someone who may have just seen some of the gameplay footage of Cyberpunk 2077, may come up with a false sense of what this game actually is. Like, one good example is a very unfortunate description or tagline, which is futuristic Grand Theft Auto, which is factually incorrect and downplays what this game actually is really about, and that is story. Cyberpunk 2077 is an open-world action-adventure RPG played from the first-person perspective. Players assume the role of V as they make their way around the dystopian metropolis of Night City. Today I'm going to hopefully answer that complicated question of what is Cyberpunk 2077 by breaking down the many aspects of the game, which includes gameplay, story, activity, mini games, classes, romance, customization, weapons, vehicles, gangs, corporations, and the open world. All the things that you will see and maybe do in Cyberpunk 2077. Hopefully this will give you a better understanding of the experience coming December 10th. I'm sure most of you have seen the hype for this game and my goal here is to give you a better understanding of the adventure that CD Projekt Red has developed for players. But as usual, before we proceed forward, if you do go on to enjoy this content and want to show your support for Cyberpunk Punk 2077 videos like this, please consider hitting that like button, subscribing for more, and turning notifications on so you do not miss out on any new content. Also, if you want to further support the channel, check out my Patreon, consider contributing, and make sure to get geared up for this upcoming game by getting the new Samurai or Wanted t-shirt designs. As always, if you are interested in getting these Cyberpunk themed tees, there will be a link in the description down below. Nonetheless, Cyberpunk 2077 has come a very long way. It began publicly in 2018 with this gameplay demo, which was jaw-dropping for many. Footage that made some question if a game of this much detail was even possible for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One console generation. Then in 2019, we had another gameplay demo, which showed various game mechanics as well as a UI overhaul and change in color scheme. But now, here in present day, just over a week from release, again, Cyberpunk 20. 77 looks very different than what it did just over one year ago. So immediately what separates Cyberpunk 2077 from developer CDPR's last AAA RPG release, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, is the fact that we get to design and choose who V is. Part of that is the character creation menu, which includes many options to give RV a distinct appearance. Like in many other RPGs, you can change the smallest and biggest things, whether that be your skin color, facial cyberware, hairstyle, beard, teeth, eye color, eyebrows, mouth, jaw, ears, scars, tattoos, piercings, eye makeup, blemishes, body scars, and more. You also have an option for what voice you wish to use for your V, male or female tones being the options. Then there is the more mature side. In Cyberpunk 2077, there is an option to censor nudity in the more naughty aspects of the game, but in the character menu, you can additionally choose your character's nipples, butt, breast size, and then customize the body parts down there, if you catch my drift. You can, for example, change the size of your cyber dong. Then, to the next part of the character creation menu, we get to decide some of our early proficiencies. So, first of all, we have our attributes, which are body, intelligence, reflexes, tech, and cool. There are said to be 20 points to distribute at the start into these five different attributes, and each of them max out at 20. Body represents the typical strength category where you can also improve your body's stamina, health, and ability to use heavy weaponry. Intelligence is mostly focused on hacking, which suits players looking to play as a netrunner. Reflexes is pretty much just agility in which you can improve your speed and reaction time, as well as your skill with blades, handguns, and rifles. The technical attribute is for crafting items such as weapons, and for handling tech weaponry. Lastly, Cool is essentially the stealth attribute in which you can become a deadly assassin if you wish to be. Now, within each of these attributes, there are skills. Think of this system literally like a tree. So for example, as we saw in recent gameplay, clicking on the reflexes attribute will bring you to three skills, which are handguns, rifles, and blades. Within each of these skills, we have perks that can be unlocked and or upgraded. So within the blade skill, we have a passive perk, Flight of the Sparrow, already unlocked and upgraded. This perk reduces the stamina cost of all attacks with blades by 50%. As you'll notice, this perk is in yellow and is fully upgraded. Perks in light blue have been unlocked but are not fully upgraded yet, and then some perks are faded out, not available 
and we cannot unlock them until we've unlocked the other perks that connect to them. Each attribute has at least two skills and numerous perks to pick from. In total, there is said to be 12 skills and over 240 perks in the game. Now another feature on this screen that is of importance is the lower left hand corner in which we have the skill progression for each of our skills. So how this works is that say you use Mantis Blades to eliminate enemies, you'll gain experience for using that weapon which is associated with the skill Blades. So once you've made enough progression with this skill, you'll level it up and gain two different rewards. The first is likely additional perk points, but the second is a little bit more interesting. As CDPR has said, using certain weaponry at first may feel off and that's actually on purpose. The more you use, say, handguns, you'll become more proficient with it, unlocking better and more smoother animations which reflect your literal skill with it. Now, let's finally move to the role-playing decision that we make at the start, the one even before we get to the character creation menu. When you go to start a new playthrough, you'll be presented with a decision, and that is what life path do you wish for your V? There are three options, the Nomad, the Street Kid, the Corpo. The Nomad is an outsider, someone leaving their Nomad clan behind for a new beginning in Night City, which quite literally means crossing the border of South Cali into North Cali by car. This version of V values family, honesty, integrity, and a love of freedom. Nomad Nomad V has experience from living life on the road which makes them better at certain things like scavenging and everything automobiles, but not being from Night City. Trust will not come easy as many are very suspicious and cautious of unknown variables. The street kid is someone who has lived and felt the pain of living in poverty in Night City. This V is someone who understands who runs the streets of Night City as they've lived in them. Street kid V has connections, has built relationships with those on the ground, understands the slang, and is willing to help out like-minded individuals. The street kid's journey begins with helping a bartender settle his debt with a local fixer, but in order to appease the fixer, V must steal a high-end car. Last but not least, the Corpo is someone who understands who really runs this city and controls everything. Corpo V starts off working for mega corporation Arasaka and is surrounded by power-hungry wolves, individuals who will do anything to continue climbing the corporate ladder to the top. This V knows not to trust anyone, as for the right price, anyone can be eliminated. Corpo V, though, eventually is forced out of his career, but with years of experience they've garnered key insider knowledge and know perfectly how to manipulate, blackmail, doublespeak, and exploit to get their way. So each life path comes with a different beginning point, and advantages, and specific skills. Additionally, each life path features unique dialogue options which unlock different paths and quests. Then on top of that, each life path features exclusive side content. So, a non-playable character located in the Badlands, the outskirts of Night City, might only have a quest for a fellow nomad. Each life path will bring a unique ending for Cyberpunk 2077, but the important thing to note here is that as you play through the game, you can transition your character to a different life path. As one CD Projekt Red developer said just a number of months ago, playing as Street Kid or Corpo, you can start working with a nomads, continue with them throughout the game, and end the game as a nomad. But when you played as a nomad and ended the game as a nomad, you would get extra pass and items. This shows that there are a lot of these layers. Layers. But more importantly, to that beginning choice of what life path we choose from, this will dictate the first couple of hours of content. This is the prologue of the game, very similar to, say, Dragon Age Origins. So each of these three life paths start out somewhere else in the world. The Corpo begins in Arasaka Towers, the street kid at a bar in Haywood, and the nomad on the outskirts of the city. Each feature a unique opening quest which has us meet a character Jackie in different circumstances. But they all will reach the same endpoint, which is a time skip by six months into a rescue mission with Jackie and later our arrival to our apartment located in Watson. It seems our relationship with Jackie has grown during that unseen period of time. Additionally, this rescue mission is the same one that was featured in the beginning of the 2018 gameplay demo. Now, that is the intro of the game, where things will start for players. Let's discuss something that was controversial, and that's the decision to have this game primarily played from the first-person perspective. Now, of course, riding on a bike walking up to a mirror, and looking at your V in the game's menu will allow you to see their appearance, but why this game doesn't have a third-person perspective option, like The Witcher 3 
Wild Hunt is actually on purpose. CDPR has said that they chose to do this because the first person point of view is there so you can see things happening up close, and so you can really interact with things in a visceral manner, with the game's world. Third person works well in games like The Witcher when you have a lot of motion and movement around you, but when all the things happen to you, from you, within you, first person point of view is the right decision to take, especially because of the augmentations. So yeah, this is a design decision, one that many disagree with, but CDPR on multiple occasions over the years have stated that they want players to have a personal feeling with the world, which is only accomplished from the first person perspective. Next, to the actual narrative of this game, I won't really discuss too much about this aspect, but essentially, the official synopsis is that you play as V, a mercenary living in a dystopian world, in which the line between humanity and technology is blurred. V takes on the riskiest job of their life, and goes after a prototype implant that is the key to immortality. Johnny Silverhand, who is most notably being portrayed by Keanu Reeves, is an established character from the tabletop RPG Cyberpunk 2020. Johnny is a digital ghost that eventually finds his way into our head, a rocker boy who isn't very nice and with a past that is full of destruction and madness. While V is our playable protagonist in 2077, we will explore Johnny's dark past through playable memories, seeing what happened through his eyes to his girlfriend Alt Cunningham, his face-off against the intimidating Adam Smasher, the nuke that was detonated in Arasaka Towers, and some of the other pivotal moments of the Fourth Corporate War, an event that comes from the tabletop RPG. Of course, being that this is a role-playing game, we will have tons of choices at our disposal. CDPR has emphasized that some quests have up to eight different ways to go about them. Even in some of the recent gameplay, we've seen some of the skill checks and different dialogue options available, which all likely leads to different outcomes for small encounters and big story moments. Most notably, and what actually has me excited for quests and story missions in Cyberpunk 2077, is the fact that CDPR developers have for years now teased that they will take on a wide array of difficult subjects and themes. Some of these quests and moments will be very emotional, sometimes horrifying with how evil humans can be. But to some of the characters that we will meet through our journey, it includes Adam Smasher, returning character from the tabletop RPG Cyberpunk 2020. Smasher in 2077, though, is a full-on Borg, more machine than man, still loyal to Corporation Arasaka, and has a lack of care for humanity. He quite literally gets joy and demands being able to kill civilians. Judy Alvarez is a brilliant brain dance technician who is affiliated with the Mox gang. She is heavily respected for her skills, innovation, and creativity, also motivated to change things for the better. Pondre is a priest and one of the greatest fixers in the Haywood district, as well as a very dangerous man. Royce, the leader of the Maelstrom gang, is a psychopath who is described as being unpredictable. Dexter Dex Deshaun is one of the best fixers of Night City and described as having killer intuition and the experience to match. Carrie Eurodyne is the former bandmate of Johnny Silverhand, both being a part of the Samurai Band in the early 2000s. In 2077, though, Carrie is still a performing artist that resides in North Oak. Saburo Arasaka, at the young age of 158 years old, is still CEO of Arasaka. Saburo is known as being a genius, who at his age is still proud, honorable, ruthless, and more hungry for power than ever. Yorinobu Arasaka is the second son of Saburo, the original heir to the Empire, but that was before he rebelled and cut ties with his father. In the tabletop RPG Cyberpunk 2020, he led a gang called the Steel Dragons trying to destroy the corporate giant, but over the years he realized the only way to cause real destruction and harm was from within. Now, you might be confused by these corporations and the roles in Night City, but the primary ones that you need to know is Arasaka, Militech, Kang Tao, and Night Corp. Arasaka is a Japanese mega corporation known for dealing in corporate security, banking, and manufacturing. They also produce weapons and military vehicles commonly used by police and security firms. Arasaka is known for maintaining one of the largest and most powerful armed forces of any corporation in the world. World. Militech is essentially their adversary. During the Fourth Corporate War, these two mega corporations dueled it out, with eventually in 2023, Militech having a team detonate a nuke off in Arasaka's Night City Towers, which also destroyed much of the corporate area. The US president blamed Arasaka for the bombing and used the event to demonize Arasaka out of the United States for some time until they eventually returned to Night City in the early 2070s and rebuilt their American headquarters. The US president at the time, during the Fourth Corporate War, War, also nationalized Militech, using its assets to strengthen the collapsing power of the United States military. In the years since, Militech has since regained some of its independence, and several of its board members 
others still hold high-ranking offices in the new USA government. Militech, though, is an American megacorporation known as one of the largest manufacturers of weapons and military vehicles in the world. If it's not clear already, in this universe, the superpowers are these corporations. Now, to a few more big players, Kang Tao is a rising Chinese megacorporation known for its cutting-edge smart weapons, and Night Corp is a mysterious, seclusive megacorporation that puts its focus on improving Night City. Night Corp is known for being the largest contractor of public procurements within the boundaries of the city, building and renovating facilities like roads, bridges, tunnels, metro lines, power plants, net transmitters, waterworks, and sewerage. Not a mega corporation, but another corporation that is smaller but of worth note is Trauma Team International, which specializes in rapid response medical services. Trauma Team is pretty much heavily armed paramedics who are extremely costly for their services, and they primarily serve the wealthy of Night City in this world. A Trauma Team client with a platinum membership level can alert for help when in trouble and expect a response in just minutes. Now, under these corporations on the actual streets, we have the Gangs of Night City. And it's important to remember that you cannot join any gang or corporation in Night City. This is not like, say, Fallout in which you can join a faction. Instead, though, you can take sides on whatever conflicts are presented to your character, V. But with the Gangs of Night City, first we have the Maelstrom, a gang that is obsessed with cyber technology and are extremely dangerous, primarily operating out of the Watson District. The Valentinos operate out of the heavily Latino Haywood and are one of the largest gangs. The Valentinos are bound by a strong moral code in century-old traditions. They treat values such as honor, justice, and brotherhood with deadly seriousness. Tiger Claws is a gang of Japanese origin and stylistic influence located in Japantown. They are ruthless and violent in practice and intimidating in appearance. Katanas, street bikes, and luminous tattoos are their trademarks. The Mox is a small gang mainly located outside of Lizzie's Bar. The Mox refer to themselves as those who protect working girls and guys from violence and abuse. The Voodoo Boys, an enigmatic gang from Pacifica, aren't just netrunners devoted to uncovering the secrets of the old net and behind the black wall. They're also edge runners, breaking every rule there is to break and programming viruses that can freeze neural networks. Founded by veterans of the Fourth Corporate War, tired of the helplessness of the NCPD, Sixth Street was meant to serve and protect the community of Vista del Rey. Today, their interpretation of the law and bringing justice to the city is questionable and self-serving. Animals, an aggressive of street fighting gang from West Pacifica that eschews the use of traditional cyberware. Instead, they use ultra testosterone and animal supplements like growth hormones. They're animalistic at heart and dangerously proud of who they are. Those are the main gangs that make up Night City. There are also scavengers, which are a gang known for kidnapping people and forcibly harvesting their cyberware. Scavengers are located all over Night City. You could also argue the NCPD is a gang as the police department is deeply corrupt, serving the interests first and foremost of powerful corporations like Arasaka that have paid off numerous officers. Now to the outskirts or badlands of Night City, we do have two nomad clans, which are essentially gangs as well. The Aldecados are described as being more open to working with V. They are known for their heavily modified vehicles, scavenging and engaging in bootlegging and transporting stolen goods. The Wraiths, though, are far more aggressive. This group travels mostly at night and preys on the sleeping and unwary. They have a long history of frequent conflict and warring with the other nomad group, the Aldecados. But finally, let's move to the world map of Cyberpunk 2077, the place which inhabits all of these characters, corporations, and gangs. One interesting detail to note is that North Cali, where Night City is located, is actually a free state in this universe. While it still is technically part of the new United States, or NUSA, it largely acts independent. South Cali, however, is part of the NUSA, which means that there is a border that separates the two states. On the Nomad Life Path at the start of it, you cross the border from the south into the north. Cyberpunk 2077's world may seem small, but it's actually a very different type of open world, with a huge focus being on verticality. Many of the giant skyscrapers that you see will have multiple floors for you to explore in, so yeah, identifying the size of Night City is extremely difficult. Night City, though, specifically is separated by six districts, with the outskirts of the city being called the Badlands. Watson is well known as one of the city's poorest districts, with many in 
industrial factories and plants being completely abandoned. Watson is also the battleground between the Maelstrom and Tiger Claws gangs. Haywood is a neighborhood of contrast, from modern skyscrapers and parks in the north to dangerous, unlivable conditions in the south. It's the biggest bedroom in Night City, where gangs like Valentino's and Sixth Street get down to business legal and illegal alike. Westbrook is home to many wealthy elites, celebrities, and corporates. It's also home to Japantown, which is known for being the cultural center for the city's sizable Japanese community, and also being the home base for many Yakuza families. Pacifica was originally meant to be a tourist trap, but instead, when funding was pulled, it became abandoned and then occupied by gangs and violence. The NCPD actually does not even bother to operate in this part of the city. So if a crime is committed here, don't expect the police to show up. Although it has been said that gangs, especially in their territories throughout Night City, will operate as police. So if you go on a rampage, expect the gangs to jump in. City Center is Night City's corporate showcase. Sleek skyscrapers form a brutalist fortress-like skyline, presenting the unrivaled power of megacorps and all its arrogance. Santo Domingo is one of Night City's oldest districts. Corporations use it as a testing ground for industrial projects, destroying old factories just to build new ones, while residents scrape a desperate living in crowded mega buildings, wishing for something better. Last but not least, the Badlands populated by nomads, this part of the world is full of vast plains outside of the city proper. Unchecked resource extraction, burning oil fields, rampant pollution, this district makes Night City feel like a rich oasis, but it holds golden opportunities for those in the know. Some of the notable locations of Night City includes the Orbital Air Space Center, located on an island west of Night City, Arasaka's headquarters is in the middle of City Center, the Afterlife Bar is owned by Rogue, a legendary solo, and the biggest fixer in Night City. This bar, which can be found in Watson, is the relaxation spot of the mercenaries of Night City. In West Brooks Japantown, we have one of Cyberpunk 2077's very mature and adult nightclubs called Clouds. This specific nightclub features dolls, which are working guys or gals that have specific cyberware that allows them to attune to the client. They can realize a client's most deeply hidden desires, and after the job is done, their cyberware allows them to forget what they were doing during the session. This is just some of the more romantic or adult content that is featured in Cyberpunk 2077. There's also adult-themed stores sporting various toys. The marketing by companies in this universe uses romance and raunchy ads to sell products. There's also working guys and girls that can be found in the streets of Night City, waiting to be picked up. As we saw in recent gameplay, they are highlighted by a lips icon above their head. CD Projekt Red does not shy away from these encounters. When these romantic scenes occur, we see, from the first person perspective, quote unquote, action happening. As previewers have noted, there was a number of positions shown in these encounters, a fair amount of full frontal female nudity and moaning in the scene. It's said to be a bit more involved and a bit more graphic than what we got in The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt as Geralt, although even with things getting a bit more dirty, it never gets full-on adult movie. And it's all over in probably 30 seconds. Now, these encounters are not just limited to random street pickups, as we can build relationships and romance characters that we meet in Night City. Some of the confirmed romance options right now include Judy Alvarez and Militech Corpo Meredith Stout. Again, though, romance is not very simple, as some characters have preferences, like it's been heavily hinted at in interviews that Judy Alvarez is only into women. Then there's also the fact that you have to build these relationships up, explore their side story arcs, choose the correct dialogue options, and make sure that, you know, that they like you. Now, romantic adventures are not the only activities that you'll find in this open world, as some of the other mini-games include a fighting tournament, which, like The Witcher 3, will bring V all around Night City to compete against the best of the best melee fighters. CDPR has teased that these mini-games have a decent amount of story connected to it. Then, there are of course street races, in which you'll take part in sometimes violent races within blocked off roads in Night City, and even sometimes the dirty, rocky off-roads of the Badlands. There is also a hacking minigame, which supposedly includes some layers to it, and includes different rewards. More minigames are in Cyberpunk 2077, but the rest are being kept as surprises. Recently, we did learn that you can ride on a roller coaster, so that's, you know, kinda neat. But besides minigames, Night City will sometimes just walk into handcrafted world events in which rival gangs may be battling it out, or we might see the NCPD's special police unit, Maxtac, asserting their power by destroying some goons. Then, within this world, we have different jobs or side quests that we can take on. The biggest and most substantial is gigs that are given to us by fixers. Each district has a fixer, and they'll send us text messages with different side activities for us to take part in, like kill contracts. Doing side activities are of importance, as building up our street cred or reputation level unlocks new pieces of content like new dialogue,
dialogue options, new fixers, and vendors that will work with us. As we become more known in Night City with building up our reputation, we'll get higher level gigs which provide us with the opportunity for special and higher level loot. It should be emphasized building street cred does not just come from gigs, it seems to be related with a lot of the side activities that we take part in. And what that includes is cyber psychosis encounters, which are described as mini boss fights. In the cyberpunk universe, sometimes people will overuse on implants and will lose their humanity resulting in them having a murderous rage for everyone around them. The max tech unit is usually called in to stop them, but V also can get contracted to take them out. Another side activity is NCPD scanner hustles, which are kind of like bounties put out by the Night City Police Department. Taking advantage of a piece of eye cyberware that we can obtain, we'll then have the ability to scan NPCs around us, and occasionally they'll pop up wanted, which allows us to kill them and make some eddies from it. Brain dances are another major feature, as they're sort of interactive memories or events of someone else's life that we can explore. It's basically a full immersion VR experience, or an evolution of the typical detective vision mechanic. Within brain dances though, you can scan, search, and consider small details, and move around fully to help in whatever quest that you're currently undertaking. It appears brain dances will feature different types of mysteries for us to explore and uncover in both the main storyline and in side quests. Sometimes it's as simple as just finding unique loot. Then lastly, we just have the typical story-related side quests that are handed out by characters that we meet in the main story. CDPR has teased that some of these side quests will or can branch back and impact the main storyline. So choice and consequences are very real with everything that we do in this world. Next, let's quickly dive into some of the further customization that we can do. So while we have discussed our character creation, attributes, skills, perks, and life paths, we also have our beautiful inventory system. Of course, we can obtain different pieces of stylish clothing. We have options available for our upper and lower body, our head, and a special slot. We also have slots for different types of equipment like stun grenades and health boosters. Then on the left-hand side, we have stats, which can be improved with choices made with the skill tree system, and I would assume with what we are wearing. Notably, better pieces of gear do feature mod slots. Our jacket in this scenario has one, while our weapons have a couple. Rarity in Cyberpunk 2077 works like this. We have common items, which are in light gray, uncommon is in light green, rare is in blue, epic is in purple, and orange is the legendary and unique items. Scattered around Night City, sold by vendors, and within certain quests, there are unique weapons, cyberware, and other pieces of gear for us to obtain. Now, specifically with our weapon slot, we have a few ways to customize our guns further. There are cosmetics or paint jobs that can be applied to change the appearance. Then there are, of course, attachments for each weapon, with the ability to add things like silencers and scopes on them. Then lastly, some weapons have software mods, which can alter fundamentals like fire rate, damage, and even damage type. But the next thing we have not mentioned from this screen is our cyber deck, which holds the different types of hacks that we can use. See, it's not as simple as just hacking people in Cyberpunk 2077. You have to rotate your daemons, or in other words, your hacks, and your cyber deck like it's a deck of cards. Each daemon is unique. One of them can be used to overheat an enemy's cybernetics or detonate a grenade. Another can have enemies off themselves. Each daemon, though, has a cost as we have to worry about our cyber deck memory that regenerates over time, and likely this memory's capacity and regeneration speed can be further upgraded by investing into the intelligence attribute, which primarily deals with hacking. But that's a choice that you'll have to make because V only has so many points to use in one playthrough. But the final thing that we have not mentioned from this inventory screen is that very important cyberware tab. Here, each body part is customizable with cyberware. With our skeleton, we can add titanium bones, which improves our carrying capacity by a little bit. This, though, is just a common piece of cyberware, which, again, the best of the best comes in the form of legendary, which in this scene we have installed as our operating system. This Raven Micro Cyber MK4 directly benefits our hacking ability as it unlocks and improves this aspect of this experience. Some other cyberware options that we have available includes in our arms, Mantis Blades, a blood pump in our cardiovascular system that improves healing, Micro Rotors is passive cyberware in our nervous system, which improves movement, speed, and precision. Sin Lungs are artificial lungs installed in our cardiovascular system that improves the regeneration of our endurance. Projectile Launch System is literally a cannon installed in the palm of our hands. Krensikov is a nervous system implant that slows down time after we successfully avoid an enemy attack. Mr. Stud and Mrs. Midnight are cyberware for our genitals, giving us a unique, fashionable appearance down there. Kuroshi Optical Scanner is eyewear 
are implants that give us the ability to scan enemies. Besides doing this to see if someone is wanted, we also can learn further information such as weaknesses and resistances. This will be of importance in the boss fights that we take part in during the main storyline. But these are just a couple examples of the many options that we'll have. But changing cyberware is not something that we can do randomly, as we must visit a ripper dock to purchase and install new cyberware. Finally though, let's next proceed to our last few subjects. We now have more on weapons, in which in Cyberpunk 2077 there are four different types. Power weapons are conventional guns in the sense that they use traditional ammo, calibers, and cartridges. This category includes a wide variety of weapons including polymer, one-shots, which are disposable, revolvers, SMGs, machine guns, shotguns, and pistols. Tech weapons are guns that use railgun technology, firing projectiles that are propelled with an electromagnetic charge. Smart weapons use gyrojet technology to fire caseless guided ammo at enemies. CDPR has said that smart weapons are great for those who may want to play Cyberpunk 2077 storyline, but are not good at shooters. Then we have melee weapons, which are self-explanatory in the sense that you'll have katanas or swords that you slice enemies in half with, and sledgehammers that you can smash enemies into pieces. Last but not least, we have vehicles, in which there are multiple classes in Cyberpunk 2077, from the cheap economy class, to the decent executive class, to the good sports car class, and to the top tier hypercars class. Then there is also a motorcycle class, which has a few different brands that provide different quality bikes for customers, as well as a heavy duty class for some of the bigger trucks that can easily ram right through things. Specifically though, with hypercars, you can truly see the difference in quality, as these vehicles feature excellent speed, armor, and technology. Some hypercars even are without windows for protection, as you're able to view outside these windowless cars thanks to screens, which are built on the inside and capture the outside. Unlike, say, weapons and other gear that you can just loot off the ground, with vehicles you cannot just steal a car and own it. Also, even stealing a car can get complicated, as there are necessary skill checks that you must meet to remove someone from their vehicle. But overall, you will need to purchase vehicles to actually own them. Once you do that, whenever you are out and about, you can call your vehicle to your position like you did with Roach in The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. But I guess one difference is the fact that you have a pull-down menu if you own multiple cars, and you can choose specifically what vehicle you wish to come to your location. While there is no vehicle customization, there are unique vehicle variants that we can earn from quests and from building relationships with certain gangs. One good example of a unique vehicle is the Wraith Gang's Custom Reaver based on the Quadra Type 66. This vehicle is specifically designed with the Badlands region in mind. Anyway, if it's not clear from everything discussed in this video and really the length of it, Cyberpunk 2077 is a massive experience with so many ways to go about it, which is why CDPR has said to get the full experience a few playthroughs will be necessary. So far, those who have had the chance to play the game have walked away with massive compliments and praise. IGN saying recently after 16 hours, even after two days of playing, I feel like I've only barely started to see what's here, and it only got me more exciting the deeper I went. Games Radar saying after 16 hours this is one hell of a game, a neon soak seduction from the first second, and PC Gamer saying after 15 hours that the game's marketing has understandably focused on the louder, more aggressive side of the game, which has painted a somewhat inaccurate picture of it. Cyberpunk 2077 is not all noise, future slang, extreme violence, and fluorescent yellow, it is quiet, touching moments of warmth too. Cyberpunk 2077 is a massive experience experience, one that developers have admitted having trouble identifying just how long one playthrough may be. Indication is that the main storyline is shorter, but one developer playthrough has them at 175 hours in, which indicates at the very least tons of side content available. But the game does feature an original soundtrack that has multiple big names attached to it, including Grimes, ASAP Rocky, Run the Jewels, and Refused, to just name a few. You'll hear the futuristic themed music of different genres on the radio stations of Night City. But this game is making use of impressive technology, just the fact alone that there are little to no loading screens is remarkable, but also the use of jolly animations to bring characters to life and ray tracing effects to really highlight and enhance the beauty of this detailed world hopefully means that we are getting a true cutting edge innovative experience. Cyberpunk 2077 is just a number of days away, and if you weren't sure what to expect or still deciding on if this is a game for you, hopefully I added some much needed clarity for this single player story focused RPG. Anyway, let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below, but thank you for watching, make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this video, or if you found any informative value, and make sure to follow my other social media accounts for updates on new videos, links are always down in the description below. I'm most active on Twitter giving opinions on news that I do not always get into video form, so do 
do make sure to follow me over there. Also check out my Discord for all sorts of discussion on games. And again, thank you for joining. Consider subscribing for more videos like this, and I'll see you later.